Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, Philippe, let's start by talking about... I don't know how you feel about talking about the Jamal Khashoggi affair, because it, it does seem to me that, that so much of international law is impacted by international politics, and, and this is a, a, a classic case in point. I, I, I wonder how you've been reflecting on the drip, drip feed that we've been, we've been getting on, on what is mm. clearly the, the most atrocious crime that's been committed. So, firstly, just thanks to Bickel for organising this. I am a long-term supporter of Bickel, and I will be a long-term supporter in the future Give, 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 I say. I will give. Um, <laughs> and it's a, an extraordinarily important institution at a very difficult moment, I think, for international law. We'll no doubt come on to that. In fact, your first question raises that. So I've, had, I've been forced to reflect on it a lot. I, w I think I would have reflected on it anyway as president of English Pen, which is an organisation about to celebrate its centenary that is committed to the protections of journalists, writers, poets bloggers, including full legal protections, including freedom of expression. Um, I did a couple of interviews on the Today program on the subject that focused on the astonishing silence of the British government. Um, the first time I appeared on the Today program, which was about a week and a half ago, the American president had spoken, Mike Pompeo had spoken, and no one from the British government had said a word about it, um, against the background, of course, of major UK arms sales to Saudi Arabia. And I said on the program, the silence is deafening. What's going on? What's going on, of course, is Brexit, because they're so terrified about losing the dribbles of foreign investment that are still coming in, and they need trade agreements, they think. So that's plainly part of the reason for the silence. Um, I left the studio, the editor was standing outside. She said, I've already called the Foreign Office and uh, asked them for a statement by the Foreign Secretary. They said they won't give one. Uh, they will give a comment, but he won't. But three hours later, he tweeted. He s issued a single tweet. Um, and uh, it was a reasonably firm tweet. Um, you could approach this story many different ways. One way, since we're at the British Institute of International Comparative Law, is what happened to the UK. What happened to the UK since 1945? The UK that was on the front line in creating a rules-based multilateral order has basically fallen off the edge. The UK that is supposed to stand up for international rules, for protections for writers, for ideas of human rights, for a multilateral system in which countries don't go around killing their own journalists in the embassies that they have around the world. And, and maybe at Bickle, that's the appropriate place uh, to deal with it. Uh, as I was saying to you before, we can speculate as to what exactly happened. We don't know the full facts, and so one has to be a little bit careful. As I said to you, I don't think we've had the full story. As a litigating barrister, I asked myself the question, if Jamal Khashoggi, if you were Jamal Khashoggi, would you walk in to a Saudi embassy in a third country without having been told by the Americans or someone else that you would be protected? And I think there is another bigger story that we have not yet heard about what has happened behind the scenes. We, we could talk about that uh, further, but let's, uh, let's just pick up on the point that you've, you've, you've raised there about the, the fact that the UK has, has fallen off the cliff, if you like, on when it comes to rules-based, multilateral um, legal framework. Let, let's talk about the, the International Courts of Justice, because this is, and, and the UK, which has for, I think, seven decades always had a UK judge on that court, and that has not, that's changed. Just explain the background to that and why you think Christopher Greenwood was not voted Straight. in. Straight to the heart of the big issues. Um, I think you need to put a little bit of context. Firstly, I think the UK has been and continues to be an incredible supporter of international courts. I feel really proud of the position that successive governments across the political spectrum have taken. Um, 
at, at many different levels. You know, the UK, you made a reference to the case in September, Kristin, it was the Chagos advisory opinion. The UK turned up and argued its case fully and properly and correctly. Many other countries would not have done that. That is a great thing about the UK. Another great thing about the UK is I've now spent more than 20 years litigating against the United Kingdom in international courts. And at no point have I ever felt a single bit of pressure from anyone in the British government to dissuade me from doing that. Completely different approach, for example, from my other country of nationality, France, when I argued the advisory opinion on nuclear weapons 20 or so years ago, I and another French colleague had people from the French government come down on us like a ton of bricks. As a French national, you do not argue against the French state before the international court. So I just want to preface what I say with that, and I really hope that doesn't change. It is unique in the world. It is a fantastic thing. And, uh, you know, everyone in the Foreign Office is incredibly respectful of that and has been across time. That has to be safeguarded and protected. So in September, for the first time ever, I appeared in a case before the International Court of Justice in which there was no British judge. Um, that was a very strange sentiment. In a certain way, it was unsettling. The circumstance, of course, was that the British candidate seeking re-election, Chris Greenwood, who I've known since he taught me international law for the first time back in 1982. So it's a very long and wonderful relationship, although very often we look at the world differently. But that's fine. I've got no problem with that at all. Reasonable people can disagree uh, about issues. And he was a very good judge. He was a very modernizing judge, actually, in terms of procedure, perhaps not in substance, but on procedure, he changed things in a very good way. All of a sudden, judges were asking you questions at the court, and that was a good thing, and things were moving along much faster. So I thought he brought a lot of very good things um, to the court in terms of process. And he was um, up for re-election. There were two slots, but there were three candidates. The other two candidates were a Lebanese, former permanent representative of Lebanon, and a sitting Indian judge. The Lebanese and the Indian won. The full story of what happened has not been told, I don't think for any particular reason, but because no one has really explored the whole issue. He was a good judge, but he was not a strong candidate. And in part, I've said this before, he was a candidate who came with a lot of baggage. He came with baggage in relation to Iraq, and that was an issue in the re-election. He came with baggage in relation to Chagos. Six months earlier, to understand what happened in that election, you have to go back six months to a General Assembly resolution on whether to refer a question on whether the decolonization of Mauritius had been completed to the International Court of Justice. And that was a process I participated in. I didn't participate in the re-election. I had nothing to do with that. But I did participate in the Chagos resolution. And that resolution passed at the General Assembly in an astonishing way. The United Kingdom and the United States managed to persuade only 13 other countries to vote with them against a GA resolution sending the matter. And that surprised me. I was skeptical in a certain sense about whether a resolution could get the majority to send the advisory opinion to the ITJ. That happened in part because of Brexit. No EU member state supported the United Kingdom. It was astonishing. I spent a day and a half on that resolution in the delegates' lounge, and delegation after delegation said, no, absolutely, we're voting in favor of the resolution, or we're going to abstain. Friends of the United Kingdom. We're sick of their mucking around, basically, and we're going to abstain. And that resolution passed with an overwhelming majority, I think 94 to 15, and only six, and 60 states abstaining. And that should have been a warning signal. That issue then got commingled with the election of the judge because Judge Greenwood had accepted appointment to an arbitral tribunal uh, six or seven years earlier 
on the Chagos issue as a serving ICJ judge. Now, within the ICJ, that's fine. My own view is no ICJ judge should be accepting any arbitral appointment in any circumstances, in part because you get into that sort of problematic issue. But he did. And that became an issue in the re-election. Um, and midway through the election process, the UK put out a letter. That I, I've seen it. I don't think it's been made public. Basically saying, Judge Greenwood's independence uh, has been put in issue. To show how independent he is, he will not be uh, sitting on the Chagos advisory opinion. Entirely correct, but having to do that comes across as incredibly defensive in an election process. And of course, the third thing that happened was Brexit. And just as with the Chagos um, you know, vote on the resolution, the support just collapsed. There was a fourth factor, which has not been spoken about very significantly, but is very important, and that's the role of the United States. And this is very painful for the United Kingdom. The country that pulled the plug on the candidacy was the United States. Okay? They withdrew a letter of support. Nikki Haley. I've seen the letter. I've seen the letter withdrawing it. Letter of support. Because they had adopted a position of equidistance between India and the United Kingdom. And in the end, they were, in effect, with the Indian candidate. Now, one could say a lot about that in terms of the merits of the relative candidates. I'm appearing currently before the ICJ, so I'm just going to avoid commenting on the relative merits. But let us just say that in terms of... Um, but let's just talk about the general thing, because what the implication of what you're saying is that the, there already is. We haven't left the European Union, but the arguments that we are having in this country over how we do that and what happens after we leave is clearly colouring the way in which other countries are treating the United Kingdom in these in these big forums of, of international law. Totally. Uh, I mean, that, 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 those are two examples, not hearsay, I, I, I mean, that I have seen for myself, that I have had countries tell me what they've done is a direct consequence of that. And I think it bodes in a worrisome way for what is coming. Um, I mean, the idea that the United Kingdom can somehow make its own way as a permanent member of the Security Council outside of the context of the European Union as effectively, reasonable people will disagree on what's going to happen. And it is a matter of speculation. But the world has changed. And if you imagine the UK sitting down, negotiating a free trade agreement or a foreign investment agreement with China, with India, with the African continent, on its own on the one hand, or as part of a block of 27 or 28 with a market of 600 million, and you ask yourself the question, where are you going to get the better deal? It's sort of blindingly obvious. You, you know, the UK is not going to get good deals because the UK doesn't have a, an equivalent thing to offer. And so this idea that we're going to enter a paradise world and have these magnificent new trade agreements to allow ourselves freed from the constraints of EU membership, things we have been unable to get, um, is troublesome. Unless what you're hoping to get, which is of course the agenda of some, is free trade agreements in which you just dispense completely or nearly completely with the kinds of standards in the field of labor, environment, social rights that are imposed by membership of the European Union. And one has to worry that that's the not so secret agenda. But the reality is, and friends in government will confirm this to you privately but not publicly, is that it is a catastrophe. It's, there's no other way to describe it. It's a complete catastrophe without even getting to the question of the breakup of the United Kingdom, which is plainly now on the cusp of happening. Northern Ireland will not be a part of the United Kingdom within 10 years. It's finished. It's over. It is, I can say it with absolute certainty. It, it's finished. The moment there is one more vote on the Republican side than on the Union side, there has to be an all-Ireland vote. It's not about whether Westminster decides to do it or not. 
it's in the Good Friday Agreement. It's going to happen, and there's going to be a united Ireland. If we have a hard Brexit, and Northern Ireland is going, Scotland will go. I've just come back this morning from a day and a half in Scotland, and across the political spectrum, at a meeting at the Faculty of Advocates this morning, that was the one point they agreed on. If there's a hard Brexit, the chances are Scotland will be gone. So we will be left with a united kingdom of England and Wales. A united kingdom of England and Wales may be able to argue its continued permanent seat on the Security Council, but frankly, it's, it's not very plausible. OK, well, let, let's just pause on that incredibly depressing thought just for a moment. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> let's, let's, let's go back and talk about your, about your, your book, um, East West Street, um, in which, which is, for those who haven't read it, you, you really should. Um, the, the, the narrative is, is absolutely terrific, but let's focus on um, the, the fact that you are attempting to talk about, the, or you do, you talk about the origins of... Um, of the law as we know it today on crimes against humanity and genocide and, and the two Jewish lawyers who wrangled all of those things out in, in, in the aftermath of, during the course of the war and in the aftermath of the Nuremberg trials. I, I, I really want to ask you about, it's quite clear in the book that you come on the side of, you fall down on the side of Hirsch Laupacht and, and, and that he, for him it was the more important crime was the crime against humanity, that the genocide, uh, the, the, the acts of genocide is a much harder law to prove. The intention mm. is almost impossible to prove. And I wonder in the context of contemporary society, I'm thinking about Syria, I'm thinking about Myanmar, you know, countries where the, the aftermath of really terrible things happening, I wonder how you reflect on which side you would fall on say, for example, in Myanmar, where the United Nations has clearly said that, that genocide has taken place. So there's a sort of unstated story in East West Street, which is that individuals really matter. And I think that comes from my experience, perhaps in negotiating various treaties, or being in court cases, or now sitting as an arbitrator in cases that the law, I mean, this is for the students of international, you, when you're taught international, you're somehow taught that the law is mechanically applied to the fact. It's not like that at all. There's always a room for manoeuvre. We, we, you know that more the more you, time you spend in that world. And that with that room for manoeuvre, personal baggage influences the direction that something is taken. And in a sense, the story of Lauterpacht and Lemkin and of Hans Frank mm. is a story that individuals can really make a difference if they go in a particular direction. In the book, I oscillate throughout, as you rightly say, between Lauterpacht's emphasis on the protection of the individual, Lemkin's emphasis on the protection of the group, and my head is completely with Lauterpacht. I buy Lemkin's, uh, Lauterpacht's fear that the concept of genocide, with the need to uh, prove the intention to destroy a group in whole or in part, tends to reinforce the sense of group identity and the fear that the very concept of genocide will give rise to the very conditions that it is intended to prevent. In other words, inventing the concept of genocide makes more genocide likely because it reifies the group over the individual. That was, in essence, Lauterpacht's fear. And yet I finished the book, as you know, at a mass grave in the middle of the Ukraine, in which the bodies of Lauterpacht's families and my grandfather's families co-mingle still today, 70 years later, in, incapable of not feeling a sense of kinship with the people or the bodies that are there through a sense of group identity that we all feel. We all feel senses of group identity, you know, for whatever reason and for whatever group it is. So I'm completely torn about it. Then, shortly after writing the book, I got involved, not in the Myanmar issue, but in the Yazidi issue. Thousands of young women and girls caught by ISIS, abused, enslaved, and raped hundreds of times. And just to say, I mean, to be in the presence, as I have been, of 
young women of 17, 18, who tell you the story of what it is to be raped five, six, seven hundred times is just as shocking a thing as I have ever heard. And it's deeply affecting. And I've worked very closely with the psychologist who created the program, Dr. Jan Kizilhan, to bring 1,100 Yazidi women from northern Iraq to Germany for post-trauma treatment to help them get over, if that is possible, what has happened to them. Pause for a moment. This country has not allowed a single person to come in for that kind of treatment. That is the kind of country we now live in, in the United Kingdom, compared to Germany. A shocking, shocking fact. When would it have been different though, Philippe? Do you think, it, you know, are you talking about the government? Are you talking about different complexions of, of government? I think it's just a sense of change, you know, creating the hostile environment for foreigners and immigrants. It's part of that process. I mean, I particularly blame, I have to say, the Prime Minister who, who has her fingerprints all over hostile environment. Windrush is her responsibility. She invented the vans going around the country with billboards on the side. Um, the DNA stuff we're hearing about today is presumably the consequence of decisions taken while she was Home Secretary. It's all fobbed off. But I want to just come back to your, question, to your first question, because Jan Kisselhan said to me, crimes against humanity, war crimes is not enough. As part of the process of making these people better, if that is possible, the, the idea that they may, in some period in the future, have a sense that justice is done is very important as part of their psychological rehabilitation. And so he spends time looking at how that could be done, and he settles on the concept of genocide rather than crimes against humanity and war crimes. Why? Because, he says, the thing about genocide is that it says to the victims international law recognizes your right to exist as a member of a group, which crimes against humanity and war crimes doesn't do. And the moment that he said that, I thought, of course, you know, it's, it's sort of blindingly obvious. You can intellectualize the individual and the group. But if you're one of these young women that's part of a small and threatened community that is told this crime allows that to happen. And when he said that to me, of course, there isn't an answer to that. There really isn't an answer to that. It's but the very isolation that you talk about, I mean, you haven't really come down. You can see the, the, the benefits of having both. Yes. I mean, I can see the benefits and the dangers of having both. If, I'm often asked, what would I have done? And of course, I, I wasn't there in 1945, and it's no critique at all of the remarkable efforts of governments, British, American, French, Soviet, Lauter, Pat, Lemkin, lots, lots and lots of other people who participated in it. But it was done on the hoof. It was done off the back of an envelope. I mean, you know, in six or seven weeks, crimes against humanity and genocide were invented and became part of international law. No one stopped and asked the question, what are the unintended consequences of going in that way? If, if international law had a properly functioning legislative system, there would be analyses and impact assessments. You know, what's it going to do? None of that happened. I would meld the two concepts into a single concept and have the destruction of groups as a sort of enhanced version of the killing of individuals in very large numbers. But it's too late. They both exist. After a 70-year gap, it seems we're going to have a convention on crimes against humanity. That is being prepared now. It's a wonderful project in the International Law Commission. I support it very, very strongly. Um, Sean Murphy is the special rapporteur, the American member of the ILC. And it will go some way towards establishing a balance. But for right or for wrong, for most people in the world, um, they believe that genocide is the crime of crimes. And that tends to enhance the place of genocide, reify it, and create a gap in which somehow if crimes against humanity are committed or war crimes are committed, well, that's not very important. So we don't really need to worry about that. So, so th there is a problem. But when you, when you look at it in the context of what's happened to the Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar, even though the UN have come out so strongly in saying that mm. this is genocide, nothing is happening. No. 
No, I, mean, we, I wonder no. how you reflect on the fact that there has been no real movement on that. No, it's, it's very, very troublesome. I, we know that for the law to have traction, there needs to be political will, and there is no political will, or there is insufficient political will, and so it's put onto the agenda, but nothing or not much happens about it. I mean, what has changed? I'm often asked by my students, what's changed between the late 1930s and today? What's changed is there exist pieces of paper with things called treaty written on them, which says you can't do that as a matter of international law. But for the people who are on the ground, knowing that there's a little piece of paper out there is not particularly helpful for the Yazidis, for the Rohingyas, but we know that international law is a um, long game. I, I take my cue from my former colleague at St. Catherine's College in Cambridge when I was a very young academic, a former professor of English legal history at Cambridge, John Baker. Uh, and as a sort of 24, 25 year old, I'd have lunch with him and he'd say, what are you working on today? And I'd say, oh, some obscure issue of international law. And he'd say, oh yes, Philippe, yes, we, we we had a similar problem in English law in about 1473, <laughs> and it took us 220 years to sort it out. And so I think if you take the long approach over time, you know, and imagine that international law today is in the sort of medieval period, you know, 1500s or something, if that, then you can feel better about where we're going. You know, you can't expect a revolution to happen in 1945 where all of a sudden states come together and say sovereignty is not absolute anymore in relation to your nationals. And all of a sudden, governments and sovereigns will keel over and say, oh, okay, we won't kill our people anymore. We'll just stop doing it. it life's not like that. It's a long game. Which, is, which goes to the heart of my next question about the International Criminal Court, which has been mired in real controversy, not least most recently with John Bolton talking about the fact that this is not that this is an authoritarian court that it's colonial um you know which kind of you could argue opens the door to despots and authoritarian regimes all over the world saying well we can do exactly as we please to our own citizens and no one will touch us because the americans are now saying that this court is is neo-colonial i mean we could spend hours talking about the ICC. <laughs> well, we I, could. you know i declare an interest i was there in rome with Andrew Clapham, we drafted the preamble to the statute of the International Criminal Court. And basically, because no one thought preambles were important, what we drafted became the preamble. It was unbelievable. <laughs> Two kids <laughs> drafting the preamble. It seems incredible. And we did take the opportunity to put little things in, like a line we put in that no one changed, saying states had a duty to um, uh, investigate and, as necessary, prosecute. Um, international crimes, and it had never been said before an international instrument, and it made its way in. But we, 20 years on, are bound to ask ourselves the question, did we create the International Criminal Court too early? Mm. Is there requisite political will to support the idea of an International Criminal Court? Uh, I pay tribute to countries like Britain and France and Germany and the 150 or so countries that have ratified it. I wonder whether they will be as supportive when they're in the firing line. The ICC has a major problem. If you go on the website, every single person who's been indicted is black and African. Black people and African people don't have a monopoly on international crime. 20 years after the creation of the ICC, we have to accept that is a serious problem. The prosecutor knows it, the judges know it, there is a serious problem. I mean, it's a bit rich for John Bolton to be talking about, you know, neo-colonialism and, but he, we have to accept he has a point. There is a problem and it needs to be addressed. Of course, the way to address it is to investigate people like John Bolton for what they did in Afghanistan. Well, that's one of the reasons that prompted him to say it. I mean, the, the idea that the crime of aggression could be introduced as something that could be prosecuted mm. is the thing that makes the Americans very nervous because that does allow a country to say, well, actually, this was an illegal war in, in the case of Iraq, for instance, or that you could prosecute uh, CIA operatives engaging in torture. In well, Afghanistan. let's focus on the torture issue because very curiously, I'm not quite sure how it happened, Afghanistan became a party to the ICC statute in 2002. 
And so it has had jurisdiction since that date over everything, for example, that has happened in the background. And in accordance with my interpretation of rules of international law, it has jurisdiction over any person who has engaged in alleged torture at Bagram, whether they are Afghan, British, American, or anything else, because the jurisdiction attaches to the territory. But there's been no investigation. We are nearly 20 years after all those events. What does that tell us about the political will that exists in the ICC prosecutor's office to investigate these kinds of issues? What it tells us is that the system of international criminal justice that was lopsided with Nuremberg, frankly, and openly, is still terribly lopsided today. And that undermines the legitimacy of the project in the eyes of a lot of people. So I don't think the crime of aggression newly introduced into the ICC in recent years is, is the essential problem for someone like John Bolton. What John Bolton wants is to avoid any situation in which any international or probably foreign court anywhere in the world investigates what any American national does. It goes as far as that. And that is his agenda. He's taken it further. He's basically said that if the ICC, well, he has said, if the ICC investigates any issue involving Americans, there will be individual sanctions against the judges. I mean, that is incredible. This is the country that in 1945 did more than any other country to create a rules-based multilateral system. And it is now targeting individual judges who are doing nothing more than carry out their job as judges. P pause there for a moment. My own view of what President Trump is doing, it's not madness. There is method to what he is doing. He wants to get rid of the 1945 settlement. Whether you take the NAFTA, climate change, the Iran deal, um, the WTO, which they're basically killing by not appointing any new appellate body members. Within a year, the appellate body will no longer be quarate because the US is blocking the appointments of judges. You want to stop an international organization working, that's what they're doing. But they're not doing it to be petty or petulant. They're doing it because they want to replace a multilateral order with a bilateral, a reinvigorated bilateral order. Take NAFTA. You replace a trilateral agreement between Mexico, Canada, and the United States in which the US has to deal both with Mexico and Canada and you replace it with two bilateral agreements. That was the aim. Actually, it sort of failed. Um, and, and, and they are left with some sort of trilateralized arrangement, although who knows what will get through Congress, particularly if there is a change in the midterm elections. It may well not get through uh, Congress. But that is the objective. So we now live in a situation, coming back to your, some of your earlier questions, in which the United States is seeking to unravel the 1945 settlement that essentially it contributed to the creation of. And the big question is, what is the UK going to do about that? Now, with this government, the single most thing, thing they are most desperate for is a free trade agreement with the United States. Last Wednesday, the Trump administration initiated the process for getting a free trade agreement with the UK and the, United States and the EU. Actually, I'm amazed it hasn't been picked up in the media. It's just a procedural thing, but they've informed Congress. So that is now in train. Um, I mean, whether they can actually do it because the UK stays in the customs union is another thing entirely, but that's fine. That's what's happened. And so the UK, for the next 10 years, is basically committed to a path of silence with the United States. The UK is going to do nothing that risks alienating the United States. The US says, actually, we prefer the Indian judge to the British candidate for the ICJ. Fine, the UK isn't going to make a big fuss. And I have to listen to Boris Johnson on, the, on, the, on Radio 4 the day after that monumental failure of British diplomacy. And I hear Boris Johnson tell Parliament, India is a common law country. It's terrific having another common law judge there. Not a single word about what an excellent candidate Judge Greenwood was. 
Not a single word about Judge Greenwood's contribution you know, to the rule of law internationally on behalf of the United Kingdom over decades of service. Just actually, we can live with an Indian judge. Why can they live with an Indian judge? Because after the United States, which is the other country the UK wants a free trade agreement with more than any other, it's India. And so we are on this path. We will never, in this country now, stick up for issues of principle, whether it's Khashoggi, or whether it's the WTO, or whether it is the Climate Change Convention, if it's going to risk in any way unsettling the primary objective, which is free trade agreements. Except that we will in, in, the, in the manifestation of people like you, Philippe. So um, I, I want to just, before we open up the questions to the floor, ask you about um, how much your life has changed since you wrote East West Street, because you are now writing, you have written uh, a sequel to it, and the, the podcast, The Rat Line, um, has been hugely successful. I mean, the, the impulse of writing East West Street was, you know, you going, being invited to Lviv to give a, a give a lecture, mm. and then discovering all these things, these connections uh, between your family uh, genealogy and and the and the, the men that you knew you were, you know, who had um, had created these these laws. Um, I just wonder how much you feel like you're becoming a historian as well as an international lawyer. Not a lawyer. historian. <laughs> or, still and always an international lawyer. I have a very good friend who you know, a writer, a Libyan writer, Hisham Matar. And I often, I turn to Hisham very often and various other people, you know, what's the right balance in life? How do you get things right? And Hisham says, you are an international lawyer. You are nourished by your experience as an international lawyer. That is what makes you stick with it. And absolutely, I... I stick with it. Sometimes it's difficult to balance a little bit. I've been a bit taken aback in a good way by what happened to East West Street. But you have to put East West Street in the context of a sort of continuum. To the extent that there was a project that was rationalized, and I'm not sure that it was, it began really in 2003 with the Iraq War and a book called Lawless World and then Torture Team and then this. And there is a sort of logic to it. And the logic is this. I came to realize with the Iraq war that there were a lot of people out there who are not international lawyers, who are not academics, who are really interested in international law. And one of the things, there are many wonderful things about the international law community, but one of the things we are not good at as a community is talking to other communities. We talk to ourselves. We have meetings amongst ourselves. We have debates amongst ourselves. And Lawless World taught me that if you can write a book that is reasonably rigorous, but which can be read by the many, many intelligent people out there who have an interest in it, you create a community that will weigh in on debates on international law. We are a tiny community of international lawyers. We cannot change anything. We are subject to the whims of political direction that can have no effect, but if we can somehow harness different people out there. And the thing that has amazed me, and in many ways, apart from the re reaction of the book on my mother, which has been fantastic, <laughs> the thing that <laughs> I love the most about East West Street, a book that astonishingly has now sold more than a quarter of a million copies, wow. is that people can read about complex issues, about crimes against humanity and genocide, and the making of international law. And how fantastic is that? And I get dozens of letters every week, by letter, by mail, by, by other means. Of people want to know more about international law. People had no idea about the distinctions between crimes against humanity and genocide. They had no idea how fragile the 1945 order was. They had no idea how treaties were made, how international courts function. And I think what we all have to do, it's not a critique, but we all have to do it better, is reach out beyond our wonderful but very confined world of international lawyers and explain why the world that we are involved in is an incredibly important world and defend it at a time that it is seriously under attack. So that's, in essence, the link between those three books. And in a sense, I suppose we could thank Tony Blair for catalyzing <laughs> this action, because if we hadn't had the Iraq war and I hadn't then gone to a dinner party 
and sat next to an editor um, from Penguin who said, what do you do? And as we all know, telling people you're a lawyer is a real <laughs> conversation killer. <laughs> but when you get into things like the Iraq war and everything, people go, oh, that's quite interesting. Mm. Yeah. So, so I think that's the lesson that I've learned. But I am an international lawyer. I will always be an international lawyer. And I will always find ways to sit on cases as an arbitrator and be occasionally counsel. I think one thing that I have cut back on dramatically is being counsel. That's one very big change because it's so time consuming. The great thing about being an arbitrator, as other people in the room know, is you do to a certain extent control the process. You don't want to have a hearing you know, in August. You say, I don't want a hearing in August. It's great. <laughs> you can't do that as counsel. Some court tells you you've got to turn up in the middle of August and argue a case. You've got to turn up and, and argue the case. So it's about being more in control.